me wrap up by mentioning a few more uh, important things about optimization. So far, we focused on join order optimization. But you have been using a lot of nested subqueries. What do you do with nested subqueries? What should an optimizer do? How does it evaluate nested subqueries? Turns out this is a very important issue. So, let us take an example of a nested subquery. Select name from instructor, where exists select star from teachers, where instructor dot id, the instructor is the outer relation here, it is being used here. So, this is an example of what is called a correlation variable. A attribute from outer relation is being used in the inner subquery and teachers dot year equal to 2000. What is this doing? For each instructor logically, it is looking through the teachers relation, finding all teachers tuple matching that instructor, checking if the year is 2000. If so, this subquery gives a non empty result and that instructor is output. So, what it means is did this instructor teach a course in 2007? That is what the query means. How does SQL evaluate this? The default evaluation strategy, which can be very, very inefficient for any nested subquery is basically what I told you. Take the outer query, if there are multiple relations there, do the join of those relations. In that join result, invoke the subquery with those parameters. Uh, what are the parameter here? The instructor uh, dot id. That is made available. The inner query is executed its result is got, then you check if the condition in this case exists is true. If so, the outer tuple can be output. Now, think about this. If there are many instructors, how many times is the inner subquery executed? If I have a, a thousand instructors, the inner query is executed a thousand times. If the inner query requires an index lookup or, or it requires a relation scan, it is going to take some time. So, even if it takes a uh, hundred milliseconds, a thousand times a hundred milliseconds is a hundred seconds. That is relatively slow for a data set where you just have a thousand instructors and if the number is larger, this will be very, very inefficient. So, the moral of this story is if you execute a nested subqueries as stated, it can be very inefficient. So, what do optimizers do about this? So, what they try to do as a first step, which works best if it works, is to take a nested subquery and turn it into a join. In this particular case, a human could recognize that, well, why do not we just join instructor with teachers on instructor id equal to teachers id and teachers dot year equal to 2000. Why do not we do the join? How do you do the join? Well, the optimizer may figure out that a hash join can be used and that hash join probably does not do random IO that much. So, it may finish much faster than a plan which uh, did the subquery per instructor. So, the first uh, line of attack is to take a nested subquery and turn it into a join. We have to be careful though. Uh, why do we have to be careful? Um, so, here is the earlier query which we have turned into a join. Select name from instructor teachers, where instructor id equal to teachers dot id and teachers dot year equal to 2000. Why do we have to be careful? The issue is duplicates. If you see the earlier one, each instructor's name is output once. Here, if an instructor is teaching uh, two courses, that instructor's name will appear twice. So, we have to deal with this. There are ways to deal with it. I would not get into it. But a good optimizer will take nested subqueries and do what is called decorrelation. So, if you remember here, this default evaluation is called correlated evaluation. Decorrelation basically takes a nested subquery and turns it into a join or a sequence of joins with multiple steps in general. Here it was easy. In other cases, it may be a little more difficult. So, all optimizers do some amount of this work, decorrelation. But uh, the conditions under which decorrelation can be done can be quite complex. So, very often what you will find is one optimizer, say PostgreSQL, can decorrelate some queries, but it cannot decorrelate others. You run the same query on Oracle, it may be able to decorrelate a nested subquery, which PostgreSQL cannot. 
you run the same query on SQL Server, it may be able to decorrelate some things which Oracle cannot. So, what is the impact of this? The same nested subquery may run very slowly in PostgreSQL, it may run faster in Oracle. The same query may run slowly in Oracle, but it may run faster in SQL Server or vice versa for that matter. So, the performance of nested subqueries uh, is hard to predict uh, if you do not know which database you are running on. If you know you are running on PostgreSQL and you really understand what PostgreSQL is doing, you may be able to say, ah, this subquery is one which PostgreSQL can decorrelate, it will run fine, but you do not know. So, how do you know what is going on? The trick is to use the explain plan feature. And when you see the explain plan feature in today's lab, you will see certain situations where PostgreSQL is able to actually decorrelate a nested subquery. You will see some situations where it is not able to. And in the latter case, the performance can be relatively slow. So, do try this out in the lab today. Um, I have already covered the material in this slide. Uh, this is a more complex one, which takes care of duplicates. I am going to skip the details, um, but I will just note again that decorrelation is more complicated when the nested subquery uses ag aggregation and it is not an exist, but equality so blah blah. There are lot of issues which a real optimizer has to deal with. So, we can uh, wrap up this session with a short quiz. So, this is just to check if you understood what I just told you. The question is, given an option of writing a query using a join versus using a correlated subquery, the options are, it is always better to write it using the subquery. The second option is, some optimizers are likely to get a better plan if the query is written using a join than if it is written using a subquery. The third option is, some optimizers are likely to get a better plan if the query is written using a subquery. And the last option is none of the above. So, uh, each center please uh, make sure the software is running. Participants please press the ST button and be ready to take the quiz. I am going to release the quiz in just a moment. Okay, the timer has started. Uh, you can go ahead and answer the question now. Okay, it's almost time up, and time is over. We'll see the results in just a bit. But to see what is the answer in this case, as we just discussed, it, if you write it using a subquery, sometimes optimizers will not be able to get a good plan. So, it, one is not a right answer. It cannot always be better to write it using a subquery. Option two is some optimizers are likely to get a better plan if the query is written using a join than if written using a subquery. This is in fact the correct answer. Um, so, in a case where the optimizer is not able to decorrelate the query, if you clever SQL programmer could have written it using a join in the first place, the optimizer will have very efficient algorithms for doing joins. So, it will come up with a good plan if you write it as a join. If you write it as a subquery and it cannot decorrelate it, it is going to have potentially a much slower uh, plan. So, that uh, is true. Three is the other way. Some optimizers are likely to get a better plan if the query is written using a subquery. Uh, this is actually not true, because all optimizers are very good at join order optimization, but at best, if you write it as a subquery, they may do as well as the join. It is very, very, very unlikely that it will do better if written as a subquery. And for none of the above is wrong. So, the correct answer is 2. So, let us see what people have said. Okay, we have 150 responses, that is good. And by far, the majority have chosen the correct answer, which is 2. Good. So, I think that pretty much wraps up. Um, we have a few more slides on materialized views and how to incrementally maintain materialized views. Uh, again, that is probably much more than you can cover in a basic database course and it is more than I can cover in the time allocated. I have kept it here, so that 
I would urge you to go read it, because it is very interesting stuff, but probably more than you can cover in a regular course. So, with that we are uh, done with um, this chapter. I will just mention these buzzwords. Materialized view maintenance is updating the result of a materialized view, when the underlying data changes. Incremental view maintenance is updating it efficiently, when there is a small change to the data. If one tuple is inserted, deleted and so on, you do not recompute the whole view, but you find out exactly what changes in the view and apply that change. So, you incrementally change the result. I am not going to tell you how it is done, um, but it is there in the book. And a few more buzzwords. Materialized view selection is given a set of queries, what is the best set of materialized views to select. In fact, there is a sub problem. Uh, an index is much like a materialized view. It, they are very similar indices and materialized views. So, the index selection problem is given a set of queries, what is the best set of indices that you should create in the database to support these queries. How do you do that? You can have a, a clever uh, uh, programmer, who is good at tuning the database, who will look at the queries that are being run and say, ah, this query could use this index, this query could use that index. But if you have a lot of queries, you may land up with a lot of indices and take up too much space and time to maintain the indices. So, how do you choose a good set? So, it turns out a good tuner can figure this out, but to simplify the job for all the rest of us, um, many databases like uh, DB2, SQL Server, Oracle, not PostgreSQL though, have a tool which can look at the queries which you are executing routinely. They can collect those queries and for some amount of time. Then you say, okay, analyze these queries and tell me what all indices to create, which will help me across this workload. Similarly, they can even suggest what materialized views to create, which will help with the given workload. So, if you have one of these databases, you can try their uh, tuning assistants or wizards or whatever they call them, uh, depending on the database to do this. There are a few more optimization techniques, advanced techniques, which are in the book. I am going to skip the details. And there is a quiz, I would not conduct it formally. Uh, let me just read the quiz and give you the answer right away. The question is, if all data is stored in main memory, query optimization is no longer needed? No, that is uh, wrong. You still can have uh, certain join orders, which generate a lot of intermediate results, others which do not. Query optimization will still be required, but queries will run faster. Yes, that is true. We are reducing the cost of disk access in IO. So, 2 is true. 3 says queries will run slower. That is silly. None of the above is also wrong. So, why do I bring this up as a quiz question? Because the memory sizes have exploded in recent years. Database sizes have exploded for uh, web uh, services and so forth, which deal with millions of users. But for a university, uh, our student population, uh, you know, growth of uh, 50 percent is already huge. So, today most of our databases fit in memory and database vendors have also recognized that. So, they are putting a lot of effort into tuning their databases for a situation, where memory is very large. And also for the situation, where flash disks are used instead of hard disks. So, the next generation of uh, releases of database systems are going to take this into account and will perform better in these situations than the current generation. So, if you have a question, please indicate it. I am uh, just going through the different centers to make to check if anyone has the question. Uh, please use chat also if you have questions. I see one question from Samrat Ashok uh, Vidisha. Samrat Ashok, I am going to put you on. Just give me one minute. Okay, Samrat Ashok, over to you. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, sir. The question is credited with the cost-based optimization algorithm hmm. using dynamic programming. Hmm. Can this problem can be treated as a NP hard problem? especially when the case of the cardinality and degree in variations. Okay. 
please switch off your mic. Yeah. So, the question is, is uh, cost space optimization, is it an NP hard problem? Uh, yes, in fact, it is uh, known to be uh, NP hard in uh, the general case. There are some special cases under certain assumptions, it can be done cheaper, but in general, uh, it is known to be an NP hard problem. In fact, there is a very interesting result, theoretical result uh, from uh, Professor Sumit Ganguly of IIT Kanpur, which showed that not only is this NP hard, even getting an approximate answer, that is getting a plan, which is uh, approximately uh, equal in cost to the best plan, within some approximation factor, constant factor, even that problem is NP hard. So, it is known to be in a class of problems, which in general is quite hard. Um, there is no known cheap solution. That said, there are a number of heuristics, which people have been using, but all the heuristics fail in certain cases. Uh, and luckily for us, the number of joins in typical queries is small. So, we can actually run an exhaustive algorithm. It's, it is NP hard. So, we use an exponential algorithm. Dynamic programming is exponential in complexity, uh, as we just saw, it's 2 power n or 3 power n. Uh, but that is still acceptable, because n is small. If n became uh, you know 20, it is going to be slow. If n is 32, it is hopeless. 2 power 32 will take forever, or 3 power 32 is even worse. So, the moral of this story is, as long as the query size is small, we can actually do exhaustive optimization with dynamic programming. If query sizes become very large, then we cannot do this. We have to use some kinds of heuristics. So, there is a lot of work on heuristics, which do not guarantee anything. Like I said, guaranteed approximation is also very, very expensive, but there are a number of heuristics, which are routinely applied to larger uh, queries. And uh, in general, they work well. There is no other option, if you have a query with 30 joins. The good news is, they are very rare. The bad news is, they do occur. So, any uh, real optimizer has to be prepared to deal with larger uh, queries with more joins. What do they do in such cases? Uh, the solutions vary. Uh, for example, uh, PostgreSQL has uh, some form of uh, genetic optimizer uh, built in, uh, which is used for very large queries, although for normal queries that is not used. Uh, similarly, other databases have their own proprietary uh, recipe for handling very large queries. Uh, they do not say much about what they do. So, that is the fallback option. Now, back to you, if you have a follow-up question. So, one more question, that can we able to improve the optimization technique, if we can able to improve the passing and translation phase? Okay. Uh, the question is, can you do something in the parsing and translation to help optimization? The answer is not really, because parsing uh, and translation is a fairly standard task. So, the optimizer should be able to take uh, whatever form and do whatever it needs to do. So, there is not much choice in that phase. So, the optimizer's uh, work is not going to change as a result. Back to you, if you have any follow up question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let us see if anybody else has a question. Okay. PSG Coimbatore has a question. PSG Coimbatore, over to you. We can see you. Please go ahead with your question. It is about run stats. Uh, usually in the batch program, we do run the run stat at the end of the program. My question is, how this impact, whether the optimizer uses the, these run stats, how this will be handled in online systems? Okay, I could not hear the first part of your question fully, but uh, I think what you said is, uh, the run stats is uh, required to get some statistics. How does the optimizer use it? Uh, is that what you meant? Otherwise, please repeat the first part of your question. Back to you. Yes, sir. Usually, we are asked to run run stats hmm. at the end of all the batch updates and hmm. inserts. Yeah. And the DBA asked us to, uh, it will impact the optimizer. But yes. my question is, how this efficiently used in online systems? Okay. Thank you. That is a good question. Uh, to uh, explain the question for those who uh, are not familiar with what the question is about, uh, we have been uh, talking about using statistics to optimize queries. And I have 
uh, quietly assumed that somehow the database has the statistics. But how does the database compute the statistics? It turns out that updating the statistics every time a relation is uh, has an update, insert, delete, update, whatever, is very expensive. So a lot of databases, uh, especially earlier on and even today for most of the databases, the statistics are not updated automatically. The database administrator has to run a command, uh, which uh, in PostgreSQL is called analyze in uh, uh, Oracle or SQL Server. Uh, there is uh, Oracle, I think, is analyze also. SQL Server is was run stats. So there is a command which is run, which will gather statistics about one or all relations. Uh, in today's lab, you will actually be doing that. Uh, you have an exercise where you will load a large relation and then do something and uh, if you do not run the analyze command, uh, the um, statistics will be wrong and then a bad plan will get chosen. You can try that out today. So, the question is uh, as I interpret it is uh, there are two parts. A, if you do not run stats, what is going to happen? Then the statistics are wrong and a bad plan will be chosen. This has happened to us uh, long back in an early version of SQL Server 6.5. Uh, we had loaded data and forgotten to uh, run this command. And we ran a query, which we just started off and then forgot about it. It was a machine which was doing nothing else. And after a couple of days, somebody noticed that the disk access light on that machine was on all the time. So, what is going on? And it turned out that query we had started was still running after two days. So, then we cancelled the query and said, what, what is going on? It is not a big relation. Why is it still running? It turned out that uh, it had the statistics wrong. It thought there was one tuple in each of the relations and so it said nested loops join is best. Guess what? Each of the relations had a million tuples and nested loops join was taking forever. So, then we uh, realized this. We ran the statistics and then the query finished in a few minutes with a million tuples. So, that is a good example and similar examples uh, occur all over. So, Whenever you make significant changes to the data, if you load a lot of data, you must run this command to update the statistics. Uh, if you are in, you know, inserting one tuple at a time all day, well then maybe the statistics are not going to change drastically in one minute or one hour or maybe even in one day, but after a few days the statistics may be significantly different. So, periodically you have to run this command. Now, obviously, this becomes a headache uh, for a human to have to remember to do all of this. So, uh, more recently, systems such as SQL Server and even Oracle, I believe, in their recent versions, they have automated this task. So, what they do is they keep track of uh, how many updates have happened overall to each relation and whenever the fraction of tuples in a relation which has been updated reaches say 20 percent, then they will automatically recompute statistics. In fact, they have some other tricks up their sleeve. For example, uh, when you run a query, which does a count star on a relation, uh, for free they can check the statistics for number of tuples on that relation and compare it with what is stored. So, uh, some of them will do tricks like, if you run a query and that provides some statistics, they will update the statistics automatically at that point. Um, so, these days, uh, the commercial ones, there is less of a need for a programmer to do these things. But even now, sometimes what happens is immediately after you load a relation, it may still have wrong statistics. But what it may do is after running a query, it realizes something went wrong with that query and later it will run the statistics and generate it. SQL Server used to do something very funny in one of the, in the previous release. Uh, they would look for statistics on a relation. If it was not there, while optimizing the query, they would compute the statistics. Then people found that sometimes the query optimization runs very slow. Um, so, some people complained and in the current version, they will actually run with whatever statistics are there, but then they will initiate a thing to compute required statistics in case this query is asked again. So, there is a number of tricks which are used to deal with either out of date or missing statistics. Okay, back to you if you have a follow up question. Uh, thank you, sir. Over to you. Okay. Okay, I will take maybe one more question. 
R C Patel, Shirpur. Over to you. My question is, sir, while executing the query evaluation plan, can we execute the query evaluation plan with the alternative that the merge join pipeline option for the query evaluation or the materialized uh, query evaluation? This option we can be entered while executing the different ways of queries. Okay, so that's a good question. The question is, um, if you give a query to PostgreSQL or any database, it chooses some plan. Can you control this? That is at least that is how I understand it. Can you tell PostgreSQL to use this join algorithm or that join algorithm or to use materialization at some point and so on? The answer is you can control it to some extent, not 100 percent in PostgreSQL, but you can tell PostgreSQL for example, uh, do not use nested loops join, do not use hash join. Uh, so, there are a few flags which PostgreSQL has. If you look up the manuals, um, you, it will tell you something about those uh, flags which you can set to prevent it from using certain things and then it will be forced to use some other join mechanism. So, there is some control. Uh, a database like Microsoft SQL Server gives you tremendous control. You can actually ask it to give you a plan. It will give you a plan in XML notation then you can actually modify it to suggest a completely different plan and give it back to the database and tell it use this plan. Now, actually the database is fairly clever. Uh, you can try tricking it into do accessing things you are not authorized to view by using an alternative plan. So, what it does is it will first check if this plan is something you are authorized to run and it is equivalent to the query and then it will use the plan you suggest. So, you can actually control this in great detail in SQL Server. Certain optimi, I think DB2 gives you no control at all or maybe very little control. Oracle gives you a fair amount of control. You can annotate, uh, you can say for this query, uh, you know, use uh, this join, use hash join, etcetera, etcetera. So, Oracle also gives you some control. So, you can play around with it. Generally speaking, it is not required. The only reason to do it is uh, if you want to, if you have a query which is running very slowly and you want to figure out if there is something you can do to run it faster, uh, but it is very rare. Most of the time a query runs slowly, not because the optimizer did something silly, but A, because you forgot to update statistics or B, it needs an index which you should have created. Um, so, usually index tuning uh, is a far more, uh, uh, you know, effective way of dealing with slow queries and occasionally creating materialized views. You cannot do it in PostgreSQL, but uh, in other uh, databases that is an option for, especially for aggregate queries, creating a materialized view is often useful. Okay. So, hope that answered your question. Back to you if you have a follow up. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, we will uh, break for the tea break. So, thank you.